it's the first time I've had a Bible up here in front, so it's a special day. <laughs> you call it transformation. <laughs> uh, it makes certain things a bit easier for this morning. So thank you. What I would like to ask you guys is not to become insensitive to God's spirit. Um, he's here and I always or see in, even in times that we, we as humans get a bit more serious, he has not disappeared. It's just we lose kind of connection. So stay in that place of, of being touched by him um, and seeing what he, what he still wants to do in your heart this morning. So thank you. Let's just close our eyes. Father, we just want to acknowledge your presence. Thank you for that. Thank you, Dad, that you um, send your only son to bring us to this place, so we can be in your presence and enjoy you as Lord, as Father. So I don't want to, really want to pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come and minister into our hearts this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. A um, couple of Sundays ago, Goody was here, and he preached with a lot of energy. But there was one thing that he mentioned which really dropped in my heart like a, a big block, uh, say um, something like a Hilux. It, so, let's, so it can weigh anything from 1.7 to 2 two tons, 1.7 tons to two tons, so it's everything that just dropped my heart, but that was the, the story of um, Anas and Caiaphas, both were high priests, Anas was, was Caiaphas's father-in-law, and Jesus had to appear before him before he went to Pontius the pilot, and as a par what leister is so for. Yeah, Pontius the pilot. <laughs> now, afterwards, he became Pontius the pirate, but yeah. But when Jesus appeared before him, Goody said one thing, and that was Caiaphas could not identify who that was in front of him. He saw Jesus, the person, but he could not see the Messiah, the, the Savior. He could not identify that part. So, he could not see past what was in front of his eyes. Okay, so we, we are preaching in the moment into vision, and this is why I would like to touch on, just before I touch on, let's do one scripture, Hebrews 12 verse 2. So I'm going to go to a couple of scriptures. I always like them, and I always like to go. Hebrews 12, 2. And it's just to, to, to make the point of, of Caiaphas as well. Here, Paul is writing to the Hebrews. And he says there in verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, a quick take apart for the joy that was set before him. There was no joy, if you think of the cross, and there was no joy of that shame. Okay, but the last bit gives it all. They were sitting at the, down. At the right hand of the throne of God, that's where the joy came. So Jesus himself, in this verse, he could see, he saw past the vision of the cross. So he could see the joy of coming, where he's going to end up, not where he's going to go. Okay, so this is the whole, the whole thing. We sometimes see, right, what's in front of us and sometimes miss what God's vision is. So... I want to talk to us about the Father's vision for the lost this morning. So, 
sometimes we just go on with life and we do life and it's a physical life and we see what the government's doing and we see what MMM is doing and nothing pleases our heart. It brings despair to us, it brings hopelessness, all these things. But if we can just look past that this morning, see what God is doing in his spirit and what his kingdom is all about here. So, okay, the Father's vision for the lost. There's two questions I would like to go and look at and see if we can answer. Um, yeah, and the, the first thing would be, what is the Father's heart for the lost? Okay, what is in his heart? For that, we go to, and I'm going to use the Bible for it. Um, Luke 15, verse 1 to 6. So this scripture will stay with us through the whole um, preaching time. I'll, I'll refer to it back again. So you can go there, Luke 15, verse 1 to 6. Just for context, those first verses. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him. Ach, to hear to him, to hear him. Okay, so this is now the baddies, the tax collectors, the sinners. Those are not the people you liked in those times. Okay, they were the... The, the kind of what's he ate scot <laughs> outcast thank you I so lekker om my engels te doen nie na by jou it was not the people everybody liked okay so they were there in a groupie and then verse two another group the Pharisees and the scribes okay now they were doing what they normally did if you read through the four gospels you will see this word comes up very often. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Okay, so there's the, comp the, the moaners of those times, which also thought they were the people. They were representing God. Um, they were the, the, the standard for spiritual life. Okay, so they were grouped there. And then Jesus, he spoke a parable to them, saying, Parables coming. What man of you, verse 4, having a hundred sheep, if it loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Okay, let's quickly look at that verse. Um, hundred sheep, ninety-nine he's got, one is lost. So where does he go and leave the ninety-nine? What does that verse say? He, go and he leaves it in the wilderness. And then he goes after the one which is lost. Does it make sense? Hmm? No, the 99 is a bit more valuable than the one. Is it not? But he leaves them in the wilderness, unattended. Most probably, I don't know. But he leaves them there and he goes after one. Okay. This is the Father's heart. Um, that... We'll, we'll see the answer there in verse 7. Maybe we can quickly jump there. Verse 7. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Okay, so there's our key. Those other people or the other sheepies did not need to be saved. They were saved. That one was unsaved. Okay, so that changes the whole picture here and we see a bit of the Father's heart. Okay, he would commit to go after that one. All the energy. Okay, verse, the verse next was verse 5. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he, when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Again, this guy goes out. He finds that one sheep, and what comes to his heart? Joy. He has found this one. It's back in his prison. He can look after it again. But he goes out and he shares that. One, I want to say, it's like home sales and on Wednesday evening. You go and share your joy, man. Other people need to share in it, but he does not stay or keep the rejoicing part himself. He goes and shares it. 
But this is a thing, thing. It's a joy. The j- rejoice. Remember. Okay, if we run on on that scripture, we don't have to read there. I just want to quickly touch on it. But following this parable, Jesus goes to the woman with a with a coin, and then he goes on to the prodigal son. The prodigal son, verse twenty. He says there, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, okay, laid eyes on him. So obviously his father was maybe waiting to see him, and then what did his father have? Compassion. The compassion made him to run, fell on his neck, and kiss him. Okay, we know what followed next. It was a whole big party. Rejoice again. Joy came out. It was rejoicing again. It was not the father on his own. The whole family rejoiced. Okay, the brother was a big dick back because of this, but the rejoicing part took place. So just pick up on the father's heart here. His heart is to go and seek you. Okay. Now, most of us that sit here today have been, what is the word, sought. <laughs> we, he's looked for us, he has found us, and he's put us in his neck, and he's brought us home. But not all of us have, so we'll give you an opportunity if you have not come to that place. But just pick up on the Father's heart here, it was to look for you and to bring you back. Back to what? Man, Arnold Sikursus. Back into the Father's house, into his home. Okay, so this is the place God wants to, he wants to reconcile you with us, with him, and put you back in that place of being a son in his house. Okay, so this is his heart. Okay, we go on to the next question here that I had, and that was how do we practically do this vision of God? Okay, so I'm going to give you a word that we don't always react to positively, but I'll explain. And it's called discipleship. Now, discipleship is not a word that runs through the Bible. It's mentioned to go and make disciples. The disciples are mentioned, but it was physical people. But the process of discipling is actually not really mentioned here. But we're going to use it anyway because we understand it. So, what is a disciple? A student. Okay. Actually, the word disciple and the word Christian means the same. It's a follower of Christ. Okay. So, as you, as you get born again and you start walking with the Lord and you grow, it's exactly the same. You are a disciple. All right. So, the whole process of, of discipling, is then actually just getting a person to get to that place of knowing God and then just walking with a person. What does the scripture teach us when you get to that place where you got to, to know God? Get baptized. It's one of the first steps there. It's mentioned to us. And then a walk. There's so many basic things. We've got, Paul has developed the booklets, discipleship booklets. Beautiful because it gives you all these basic building blocks on which you can build further. So there's so much that God has given us as a congregation and in life to, do, to actually build on this. Okay, that's the one process. The one thing I want to say to you about discipleship, and I've said it in our cell group meetings, it's a very natural process. Okay, there's a Tanya in our cell group that likes to talk. She connects to people so easily because she's got the mouth and she can project it. She does it so beautifully. Okay. She does it. Her husband is a still guy. He still connects even with less, but just with less words. But he connects with people naturally. So I want to say to you, it's a natural process. It's not an unnatural process. This thing we call discipleship, it's very natural. Connect with the people and so on. But... I want to also say it is a very unnatural process as well. Because once you've made contact, that's a good, that's the easy part kind of. 
But then God is needing to, of needs to use you in that thing, and this is where the unnatural comes in. Where Louis goes up to, sorry that you guys are an example today, where he goes up to somebody while working and he sees this guy's hurt or something and says, can I pray for you guys? He says, yes. Louis goes and he prays. He prays one sentence of healing in Jesus' name over the person. He gets healed. Okay. So it's, it's not a, let's say, it's a natural process for Louis, but an unnatural thing happens there. So just realize discipleship has got a part of it that is unnatural, but this is where we need to allow God to come into the situation and do his work. You, the supernatural, yeah, sorry, did I say unnatural? Supernatural, supernatural, sorry, supernatural, supernatural. We need to, we need to allow him to do that. Um, we don't always have a faith, but you know what? When you get into a car the first time, and you put in the key and you turn the key and the key st- uh, the car starts, you're going to drive off the first time. Was it a relaxed exercise? No, no. <laughs> Your heart starts beating somewhere here, not down here. The thing is, it is not. So once you've done it, You've taken that first step, it becomes easier, more relaxed. Now I do it without thinking. And because I drive a Toyota, it must start. I'm not, my expectation is it is going to start. So the faith is huge. My anyway, <laughs> this is how we do in a, in a, um, in a, in a process. You get into it, and at first time it's not going to be easy. Go and ask Louis if it was easy. God had to prompt him in a vehicle, as I remember, for that prayers. So it was not a, a thing that just came. And he had to take that step of faith, prayed for the person, the person got healed. All right. You need to take that first step. All right. So here you go. These three things I want to quickly touch on um, about discipleship. The first thing is how do you know that you are qualified to disciple people. A lot of us sit here and we think maybe we're too young or maybe we think we're too old. Oh, so sorry that I used the auntie law. I could have used my wife though, but she would have been angry at me. The thing is, we sometimes disqualify ourselves. There's no qualification. There's one qualification. Let me quickly read it for you. Sorry. There is a qualification for that. 1 John 2, 3, 23. 1 John 2, 23. That says, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So we're looking at the Father's vision for the lost, but it refers to the Son. So if you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, the one thing he has done, you have recognized the fact that he has stand proxy for your bad life, for all the lies, for all the nonsense you've done. He stand proxy and you accept that in faith. But the other thing he has done was he has reconnected you to the Father for you to be able to carry this vision of the Father for the lost. And this is why I say, if you think you don't qualify, sorry, you qualify. All right, it's good to be baptized. So glory to what's going to happen today. Um, but again, there's no thing that you need to be that many years a Christian or following Christ before you can actually get into the process of doing. You qualify. All right. Bottom line. So the next thing is how do we know who to invest in? Because a lot of times what happens is I go out and I pray for a specific person that I think, hey, this person, not sure if I should. And then God doesn't really tell me, yes, go for that one. I'll be honest with you. I've never had really great success going to pray for a name or something. But 
this verse that we had in, in, in Luke, if I can go back to that verse 7. Um, why did he go after that one sheep? Over one sinner who repents, then over 99 just people. That one sheep was not just. He was still a sinner. So, who do you go after? I want to tell you now today, you can disagree with me on this one, but don't wait for, go after an unjust a sinner person. All right, Jesus has sent out his, I think it was the 70 that he sent out. He told them, listen, if you get to a place where they don't receive you, dust it and go on. Don't waste your time. So that still applies. So you need to discern with this. But I want to say to you, a person who's unjust qualifies to be attacked by you. Attacked in inverted commas here, please. <laughs> Targeted is a good word. Mm, I remember the one guy that was an elder here. We had an outreach at the university. And I was keen and I was walking with him. And... Um, we saw students, and I just started, vrrr, and he said to me, Rista, Christo, Rista. <laughs> so, I know I can get excited with these, but uh, again, the target a person, chat to them, connect to them. There's courses that's going to run through the year here at Hebron. There's other places. I think there's one planned for the youth, young adults, students. These are opportunities, people, to bring in a person an unjust person for that matter, or a person who has just lost that connection. All right. So if you want to know who to, 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 to target, these are the guys that are not just. Um, and on this thing, I want to tell you um, something I've experienced over, over time is my closeness with the Father is a direct direction giver in my connection with unjust people. So if I'm close to the Lord, I speak quite easily. Scripture comes to me quite easily. I can quote Scripture. I can speak right into the spot where this person needs it. If I'm a bit distant from the Father, I struggle with this discerning thing. And I'm a bit blunt in my spirit. I don't, whoops, get into the place where that person needs it always. So I make some ex mistakes because I've got a big mouth, so then I do make mistakes. So uh, in this case of, of targeting a person, your closeness with the Lord is such an important thing. It is one of the things Jesus died for. That curtain didn't rip just partly that you can peep in. It ripped right through and he said, come into the Father's presence. So, and if you get up in the morning, it's good to read scripture. It's so good. Fill it, fill it, fill it. You need scripture because this is what the Holy Spirit runs. It's like oil in your joints. You need it. You need it to get scripture in your system. But I want to say to you, get, become still before the Lord and just sit with him. Just hear his heart. Usele, lip tip, lip tip, lip tip. The heartbeat of God. Just go and sit in that corpus area. It's close to the, as Paul has explained, this area close to the to the chest area, uh, to the chest. And just sit in that place with the Father. He said, here I am. Sit, pick up his heart. All right. So feed yourself. Stay close to him. Um, there's a guy that in big faith just told me now, that he had to take certain steps because where he was in position was influencing his time with the Lord. Now that is faith. If you start changing big things in your life to align yourself to have contact with God, this is what we need to. So again, if I can go to the right in the beginning, look past the physical and um, uh, life or the physical things that is in front of you, look past and see God's vision. All right. See God's vision. Okay, so on we go. Ah, let me just read one scripture here on 
picking up on God's heart for other people and how, who we need to invest in. 1 Thessalonians 2. It's always a twos today, but it's not my fault. It just came. It's 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 and 8. Paul writing. To the Thessalonians. But he says here, and you just pick up Paul's heart in terms of walking with a person. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own child, children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. So he says, actually, I will give up some of my life to impart in you. This is how important this relationship has become for them. So see it as, as, as a group of people that was established by Paul and others, but his heart for them was to look after them. I don't think there's a stronger bond on planet Earth, physical bond, than between a mother and a child. I don't think so. I get all seen how Mama Lewis, Groot Lewis, anvat because they were coming in between her and the cubs. This this whole instinct thing becomes seriously uplifted or enlarged you and you protect. Okay, so this was Paul's heart for. All right, so I want to ask you if you do take on somebody, people, in terms of walking with, have this heart. See God in them. Don't look. At the outside, man, there's people that's not so nice to, to engage with. I tell you, we know, we know. I'm not going to go into details, but there's certain people we do not want to engage in. If God calls you that person, do the commitment, go. But God will usually bring people who Christo will work with in a natural quite easy. It will usually happen like that. I can't say it's a, it's a law. It's nowhere in the Bible. I just saw it from experience. People I connect to with earlier, ach, easy, it happens. Sometimes you walk with a person. One friend of mine, I've been working, walking nearly 30 years. Things are happening in his life now. Then there's other people that I've walked with a month or two, and things happened. I can understand. So it's not every person, and it's people who will naturally come to you. I know some of you that we speak a bit more because in the same home cell have people that work with us that irritate 15 extra colors out of our lives. Not beautiful colors. Realize if God puts you in that, you need to learn something. It's what I said in home cell one time. I needed patience and Brian just smiled and he looked at me. He said, you know what God's going to do? <laughs> so he brings people into your life that forces you to become patient and that's not a fun process <laughs> remember when you pray for something but that might happen in your life just see God wants to teach you something with it as well All right so connect in the natural and then see if you can walk in the supernatural in that relationship with which brings us to one thing again this is an ad break there's this course that we run for the first time, ne? Slavery to son Sonship. Second time. Mm, okay, sorry, I missed the first one. Spiritual slavery to spiritual sonship is the whole t title of the course. It is beautiful. Getting to it, if you have not done it, do it. It's an opportunity for these things because you might miss people in your life that you can disciple. You might miss them because you sit with a heart that looks after your own interests and not go after God's vision for the lost. Okay, And we need to get that thing shifted in our hearts. I tell you, if Crystal goes home certain days, I go and I switch off. So Lizette and I will watch a series or a movie or whatever. But we switch off. Um, it was this past week, ne? on your birthday, that a person wanted to come and see us. I actually wanted to ask him, please, another day. Because the morning I had to get my wife's permission 
to go out and do photographs at Sotpan for the museum, which I did. She allowed me to. Came back and I just wanted to relax. So this guy's still adamant. This guy pitched up. We had a short conversation. And so much good has come from that time. Christo had to sacrifice beautiful rest time for somebody else. It's going to happen, people. It's going to happen. So realize it's not a smooth rule. It's not like a Hilux. You're going to have problems along. Okay. Sorry, let me so hard, but I'm not so glad to me. Not always, but it happens. But the, the outcome of that was still waiting for, but I'm expecting a very positive outcome. So, but things happen like this in our lives. So they are going to test us a bit. So you need to discern. Lulu's got a beautiful book on boundaries. Know them, especially if you walk a road with people. Okay, last question here I just want to touch, and then there's one thing I want to mention. When is it okay to let go of a person that you're discipling? Do you know? Okay, I don't think there's rules and so on. I just got these things for myself. It's things that I struggled with in my own life. And the one thing there is the only thing I can actually say to you. Verse 7, it says, if a person is not just, if a person is not in that place, that is the person you go after, all right? Go after until you see this person can actually take on somebody. Who's seen that movie, The War Room? Yes, she prays in the end, Lord, you've done it again, you've done it again. She has walked the movie with one lady. That lady was in a place where she actually started to step out and get another person in. She knew it's time to release this disciple, okay? The process, basic process is finished. So you'll get that in your life, but there's no set rule there. You walk with a person, some are stubborn, they don't pick up quick. There's others that pick up very quick. Um, you will discern. So there's no rule to this one, but you need to see, because otherwise that person can just become a drag in your life as well. Right, I've had people who attached themselves because I had a wallet. And in the wallet there was stuff that the um, treasury, no, not treasury, reserve bank, reserve bank prints it, those little pieces of paper. And the people loved me because I had pieces of paper with an R on it in my wallet. And I realized, uh, uh, this is dust that you need to dust off your shoes and go on. You need to discern because those people can eat your time. Okay. So we are not here to work at the National Museum. Sorry, Derek. Um, we are not, this is not our calling. This is where God has placed us. You are called to go and carry this vision of God, the one of compassion, of a father who looks for to carry that heart to the unjust out there, the sinners. Okay, sorry for that. We are called to this. Do you think it's an option for you as a Christian to actually sit and come to services and maybe home cell and that's it? As I've read and I've looked and prepped for this, I realize it's not an option. If you call the Christian, it says you are a disciple of Christ, then go and disciple. That was Jesus' last words. He says, just go and make disciples, baptizing them. And they the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So it's part of us. Paul and Shannon does not get in contact with unjust people that much, not as much as we do It's in the workplaces. They are still after other people as well. I've realized one thing, and that was in uh, the tills. If I say to that lady or guy, it's most of the time it's ladies, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope your work time goes quickly past. Man, the faces just light up. You can see it's just the door that opens. It, it takes nothing from us to be just nice to people, and you can see an open door. And these are the places we need to identify and step into. And just be yourself. The, go and ask Louis about his first pre-experience of feeling. It was a supernatural that came because he just acted naturally. All right. So I want to encourage you. Last verse. Then I'm done. 
John 4, 35. Bolas gave me this word, this verse. <laughs> okay, famous one, and it's in front of the Blyke, I think it is. You, Arnold, you read it. But just the background on this, on this verse. The lady at the well, <clears throat> so Jesus sent his disciples in to go and buy KFC. They were hungry. He stands there waiting, and this lady comes, a Samaritan woman. She's not really accepted by society as is, rejected person. Um, and I think Paul gave me a short preach on that. It was beautiful. Thank you. I'm going to highlight on it. She was not in the time frame that you usually come. If you look at it, even in Zim, we saw it. They come early morning or late afternoon to water the, the animals and to take water for themselves. And this lady came during the day, so she was alone. They usually come in groups, she was alone. Okay, opportunity. This is what God, um, Jesus saw. So he sat and he spoke to her and he gave her those famous words and to worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, it changes this lady's life. She goes back to the little town and guess what? The staff of KFC and everybody gets born again in, in the place. They get to know about Jesus. Okay, so the impact from one person's conversation, and it was not the, the mayor, as we usually see, get the most influential person. No, it was one of the most influential, of most non-influential people in that town, most probably, that Jesus had a conversation. He touched the heart and... Uh, a, a town changed. Okay, so this verse follows on this. John 4, 35. Do you not say, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. for They are already white for harvest. Okay. This is where we stand now. So we've been preaching into vision. If you can go, even if you go and look up yourself, what the Father's heart is for the lost, you'll see. What the, the one scripture we read here in, in Luke, that compassion for, he wants them back. We are his hands and feet. So if I can encourage you to go and connect, the harvest is ripe. So you'll find that one person that reacts like that and responds positively to you. Okay, just don't hold back. Just be who you've been. You've been blessed, 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 blessed. Um, so just share that with, with, the, with the other people. Okay. Can I pray for you? Thank you. We, I want to pray for myself in this respect. I want to pray two things that we will identify that we really carry this vision or just grab this vision that God planted in our heart. And the second thing is just to be able to move with that vision. So, you know, if you can just trust with me, Lord, we just want to thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that you have called us out of that mud pool that we called sin. You've lifted us, you cleaned us up, and you presented us to the Father. We want to thank you for that. Thank you that we can sit here as your children and have your vision, Father, in our hearts. So I my pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come and burn that vision into our hearts for the lost. And that we will not miss opportunities, Lord, that you will just really. And if we go out here, it's easy to talk about it here in Hebron. It's a safe place for us to chat about these things. But, Lord, when we out there at work doing our weekly things, I want to pray this is where you will plant your Father's vision in our hearts and walk with us in that and just really open our eyes to opportunity. So I really want to give you all the honor, all the glory, and say thank you that testimonies will come from reactivated lives. And we want to thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.